Hello and welcome to the October 8th edition of the Bub Report. I am Dr. Kellen Bub. This week on our program, we probe and dig deeper into Grenada's elusive oil and gas prospects. This against the backdrop of government's recent announcement to launch an investigation into what it alleges are missing oil and gas documentation from government's ministries. The oil and gas, where very little or no files exist within any of the official government ministries, but we will deal with that one in due course. I want to find out what happened to the oil and gas. I think so every I. citizen of Grenada deserves an answer. I honestly don't know. Right? Certainly from all indications, including newspaper uh, uh, and, and, and media accounts in Trinidad, there was some deal signed between the National Gas Company of Trinidad and Tobago and GPG. And I would have assumed at a minimum, the state of Grenada and the citizens of Grenada would have to have benefited from this deal. I've never heard anything of it. Following the government's throne speech in September of this year, delivered on the opening day of the first legislative session of the 11th Parliament, the opposition NNP rubbished any idea that the files are missing by way of a press conference and by way of an appearance on NNP's talking points by former Energy Minister Gregory Bowen. They've carefully chosen the words to send out in new endos. And as I indicated, you want help in not finding but putting it in front of you. Then just so you know to find me with a or a new field as a case with the green the true blue development. You you could have found me and you didn't need me. But issues of confidentiality in the Caribbean region's hydrocarbon sector is not unique to Grenada. Citizens in Suriname and Guyana have also expressed concern about the lack of transparency with respect to their oil and gas prospects. In an article written by Harvey Panker in June of this year, he said, quote, In Suriname, oil bids are conducted largely in secret. Oil contracts and other documentation are kept from the public despite more than six years of government promises to publish them, unquote. This week on our program, we delve deeper into the oil and gas debate and whether or not these energy prospects would ever materialize for Grenada and other Caribbean islands. Also on our program, we sit with two cast members of the Labucan Creative Center who will preview their upcoming play, Redemption Time, Redemption Time will commence on October 20th, 23, at the center, and the play will dramatize the period leading up to and beyond the events of October 19th, 1983 in Grenada. We welcome our guests, Francis Urias Peters, playwright, Anselm Cloud, maritime attorney, Dr. Vincent Adams, environmental engineer, Giselle Carrington, actress, and Harvey Panker, Surinamese-based investigative journalist. I am your host, Dr. Kellen Buck, with this week's editorial titled, When the Fox Guards the Hen House, Police Accountability in Grenada. We thank you for joining us. A pleasant good morning to our viewers and listeners, and we welcome you to this week's episode of The Bub Report. I'm your humble host, Dr. Kellen Bubb. Please remember to like and share this live stream so that more people can have a chance to join us in this enriching conversation this morning. Unfortunately, our editorial uh, is not ready as yet, and so we will be publishing the editorial later in the program. But we want to respect our guests' time, and we want to get to our first segment by welcoming uh, Mr. Francis Urias Peters of the Labucan Creative Center. He's one of the creative directors at the center. And Giselle Carrington, who is an actress with the Labucan Creative Center. Lady and gentlemen, welcome uh -huh. to this week's edition of the Bob Report. Thank you, Dr. Bob. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Absolutely. You. And uh, we, we are meeting in, uh, shall we say, historic October. Mm -hmm. I call October historic in Grenada for many reasons. Of course, one is uh, there was... Uh, the assassination of a prime minister, and there was also an invasion. Some call it an intervention, some call it a rescue mission. But uh, you are putting uh, Grenada's history uh, into dramatic production, Francis, this year, as you've done in the past. Uh, talk to us about the significance 
of uh, this year's um, play against the backdrop of the government's declaration of uh, October 19th as a public holiday. Of course, redemption time we're talking about. Well, this is the 40th anniversary of the demise of the Grenada Revolution. I think 40 is a significant um, number. And we believe here that uh, history needs to be uppermost in the minds of our, of our people. Because there's a, um, a quote by Marcus Garvey says that the people without a sense of the history is like a tree without roots. I know there's another quote which says that the people who forget the past the history tend to repeat the mistakes of, of the past and take into consideration that Grenada has such a youthful population. I think almost 65% um, of the population is around 40 years of age or even under. And a lot of them don't have an understanding in a sense of what happened on October 19th. And we just feel it is so vitally important for us to share the histories. And you don't have to like it or you don't have to agree with the history. What is important here is that history be taught. So Redemption Time is set to join just prior to the overthrow of Eric Matthew Gary in the late 70s. And it goes into the revolutionary period. But it's not necessarily a play per se on the revolution itself. It's set during that period and show how the two political divides, that of Eric Matthew Gary's government and leadership and that of the New Drill, New Drill Movement slash PRG, affected a working class family, how they were torn and the conflict and the stripes. But even amidst that, there is uh, a human interest story. There's love, there is um, there is romance, there is whole issue of reconciliation, possibly. And I must say so that the play was first staged in 2013. That was 10 years ago. So it's the 10th anniversary of the redemption time. And here we are back again. And to do it as part of the commemoration of the 40th um, anniversary, you know, because the theater we think is so powerful to teach and to change lives. And that is what my, I, my whole focus is on when I'm doing theater. It's just, yes, entertainment, education, but the ability to change people's lives. It is so very important. And based on the feedback I've been getting over the years, and a thank you to Dr. Bob for you see, the impact that the theater course at Times to see have had. And that is, what, that is what we are about. And I'm happy to yeah. be with a brilliant cast. As you know, um, Giselle is on or making a debut on the big stage in a small venue. And we're happy to have her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Francis, let us uh, talk about, of course, Redemption Time uh, was uh, screened in the past. This is not the first time uh, that, uh, but for obviously, it, it may be the first time for a new audience, uh, perhaps shall we say for a new generation yes. of Grenadians who might not have seen the play. Talk mm -hmm. to us about uh, the backdrop of the play, the, the context in which uh, this play, you, you've articulated uh, how it establishes that political divide. But when you were thinking about uh, uh, directing uh, this play, what, what was uppermost in your mind? All right, so let me just backtrack a bit. I must say that this yeah. play took me 10 years to complete. In mm -hmm. fact, the idea for the play came in 1984 when I was a student at the Jamaica School of Drama. Mm -hmm. I returned to Grenada in 1986, but it was not until 2013 that the play was, was, was staged. So that gives you an idea of how um, challenging it was for me to, to write a play. One of the challenges was that how do I present Eric Matthew Gary, very complex and let's say from a Grenadian context, larger than life human um, person, mm -hmm. Morris Bishop, that eloquent <laughs> um, personality, how do I really write their character into the play? And I realized here yeah, that is going to be a challenge. Mm -hmm. So what I did was to go along what I call the journalistic route, where we normally say here yeah, that if there's an issue that you have to deal with and a contentious issue, always look at how that issue affects the real people and the real people as ordinary men and women um, in our communities. So I decided to start creating the characters and the first character that i created was a woman called miss audrey who was a representation of gary she was a like gary Eight or gary Wright, and uh, so that was how i i, cre I created um start, start the process created miss audrey she had a son called steve who was a supporter of the njm so you could understand the sort of conflict that you have a person coming from the Gary at home and is supporting the NJM. So conflict without drama, there's no, there's no um, conflict. So all the characters that I created, they were more representation, rep representational of the, um, of the issues. So you have a character called Joseph, who was the representation of the 
hierarchy of the NJM slash the slash um, the the PRG. Winston, Miss Audrey's son, again, he was a new born again Christian, but Miss Audrey is a spiritual Baptist, a woman who can see things, who can foretell and forecast, but you can imagine the tension that you'll have where I'm new, a new a born again evangelical convert and versus Miss Audrey, but they, despite they loved each other, but you can imagine the setup there, that's, go, that's going, going to happen. Mm -hmm. You have also Rachel, who is an activist of the NJM and her relationship with, with um, Winston, her estranged boyfriend, and also, all of these are the complexities that run into this story. Mm -hmm. We also have the character of um, Sylvan McIntyre plays the secret police at that time, Gary's secret police, mm -hmm. and how he factors into that character, factors into the, the, um, the plot. So it's a lot of intrigue because I realize here that with play has to be exciting, there has to be drama. So there's not a dull moment in that play two hours and 15 minutes not one single moment that there is any any um, mm -hmm. um boredom and with of the cast you know we have been working very very hard over the past um, um seven weeks we promised yeah. the the order or patrons an exciting three weekends we are doing it at labocan creative center it's a small space and we have exper ex experimented and so far we know that it is going to be a very powerful presentation mm -hmm. a lot of things yeah. that we hope because the place i think is going to be it is going to be um ther therapeutical even though it has um tragic elements there mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the spiritual Baptist uh, character and that you're giving visibility to that particular character in the play. Yeah. And uh -huh. of course, I'll get to Giselle shortly, who would be another cast member. Uh -huh. But talk to me about the significance of casting that particular female character as a spiritual Baptist. Uh -huh. Given the, 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 the anti-spiritual Baptist bias that we see uh -huh. in Grenada, um, people of the spiritual Baptist faith are, quite frankly, are, are the last bastion of religious prejudice that we see on the island, mm -hmm. um, especially coming from those who uh, belong to the, the, the colonized Christian churches, shall mm -hmm. we say. Talk to wow. me about that character. Well, as I said before, I developed that character based on my aunt. I grew up in Marquis. I was born in Laguna Road, mm -hmm. but I grew up in Marquis as a young boy. Mm -hmm. And my aunt was a strong Garyite, I said. She was a Roman Catholic mm -hmm. and a Garyite. But what I decided to make the twist, because Eric Matthew Gary, I like Eric Williams of Trinidad and Tobago, the former prime minister, Edward Siago of Jamaica, former prime minister, they identified with the grassroots religion. So yes. I decided here, because she's a representation of um, the Gary system, to turn make her into a spiritual Baptist. For me, again, I think it's very important for us to really hold on to our roots because it seems as though anything that represents Africa, we in Grenada <laughs> tend to, not everybody, but from a religious standpoint, tend to look down on that spirituality. And I say here, as a person, I'm grounded in the, the, the and identify with what Katia Marisho says, the barefoot people of this island. I'm a, still a country boy. And I yes. just think it's important <laughs> to punctuate that, to, to, make a, to make a plug here that spirituality mm -hmm. and religion is, they're, they're, being religious is, are two different things. You speak mm -hmm. of whatever religion you come from, spirituality is a totally different thing. So I really wanted to punctuate that, that irrespective of whatever the religious belief, there is value in in that religion so and i and, and again too because of i am a person grounded in in the folk so whether i go to calypso whether i go to um uh what we call the 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 soca you know yeah. they, they are the they are the, the um they are the, the baptist rhythms are there where is all mm -hmm. why you turn back so that is part of who i am the drums the chants and i still listen because it's a play grounded in that time period and the reality I have mm -hmm. to project that and I say she's a prophetess, she can see things, she can foretell, and this character is a very, 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 very central. And I always like to punctuate who we are, whether it's the drums, whether it's the calypso, whether it's the folk. And that's the reason why I think it's so very important for that character to be scripted there. And so at yeah. least we will have some respect and understanding of who the Baptist people are. Absolutely. And uh, uh, Giselle, uh, welcome to the Burb Report. Uh, you are one of the younger uh, cast members uh, that would be on, uh, on, uh, in, in the play. Um, talk to us about 
uh, who inspired you to get involved in uh, the theater arts? Well, good morning, and thank you for having me. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> to be very, very honest, so I am Trinidadian, born and bred Trinidadian, living in, mm -hmm. in Grenada. Mm -hmm. um, I've always loved things in entertainment. From a very, very young age, my grandfather was a mass man. He had a mass band, a fancy sailor band in Trinidad. And I always loved that aspect of, of life, you know, the, the, the music, the, the history of behind everything. And I just like to play, honestly. I just like to play. And it is getting involved with Labukan through Zalika Peters, if Urias knows her. Mm -hmm. um, through Zalika being involved in the Calabash Nights that we have. Uncle Yu just one day was like, just have you ever thought about acting? And honestly, I didn't give it a, a second thought when he asked, I said, yeah. And so that is literally my history with the theater arts, especially here. You know, I've done plays in school like any other person would have done, um, drama club and all of that. But um, Uncle Urias is the main reason and the main motivator for, for me being involved here right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I will tell you this, he has motivated several generations of Grenadians, including myself. And, and and it's something that I always talk about. Um, as, as, one of, as one of the younger cast members, um, how would you say, what were some of the most interesting aspects of preparing for uh, this particular production for you? Um, well, again, being from Trinidad, you know, you hear and you know about the revolution, but you know, you don't know the specifics and exactly what went on and, and all of that. So in reading the, the script, not just my part, but going through the script, it was like eye opening. You know, you know, these people mm -hmm. went through so many different things on so many different levels. And for me, it was just learning so many new things about it from that family point of view, the division was in one family in different directions. Um just he just figuring out like how how deep everything went and how it impacted so many different people in so many different ways. And then bringing everybody together at the same time because my character Rachel, she is she's a strong woman. She's a strong woman. And that for me was was very, very, you know, exciting and and eye opening. And I couldn't even I couldn't even put down the script after a point in time, not even focusing on my own part, just going through it and being like, oh my goodness, wow. Wow, yeah. oh, wow, 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 wow. wow. <laughs> it's been, it's been a, 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 like a roller coaster of emotions for me because sometimes mm -hmm. I would literally be in tears, you know, just trying to figure out like, how do I do this or how do I do that? And then there's sometimes I'm like, oh, that happened. Let's pull some popcorn because this is drama at its finest. It's really well written and you get a lot of insight yeah. into the happenings because it's so mm -hmm. well versed and put together with the actual historical, you know, um, things that took place mm -hmm. during that time. Yeah. Now we live in this uh, TikTok age, this age <laughs> of uh, 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 so many uh, different social media attractions shall or distractions, shall we say. And, and sometimes, uh, because of the, the 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 ubiquitous nature of social media, um, a lot tends to get lost in the sauce. You know, how do we get younger people to 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 be attracted to the theater arts? Because that there is a level of uh, of 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 intensive labor that goes into it. Yes, um, yes. and so. Young people like yourself, it gives me hope when I see young people like yourself in, in, in the theater arts. Um, but how do we get much more young people involved from your experience? I think, well, firstly, I'm not as young as I appear. <laughs> I might be you, new to the, the theater arts, but you know, the age of TikTok is a little just below me a little bit. I'm very involved in it, yes, but I'm not one of those content okay. creators. But I think one of the things that's important is you know, kind of fusing the two mm -hmm. and kind of using using the social media platforms to appeal to the younger persons because once it's there and it catches their eye, they're going to be interested because I'm also a teacher. And mm -hmm. uh, just knowing that um, I, I teach these young minds and you can get them. I've heard children singing things from Marvin Gaye and all of that just because it is trending on TikTok or trending mm -hmm. on Instagram. And uh, it's there. So I think what um, Labukan has been doing, they've been showing different parts of, of the activities they would have and they'll be using them in reels and TikTok videos 
um, on, on, on the social media platforms and it's actually pulling more people in to be interested. And of course, once they're interested and they see, okay, this person can sing, maybe I want to try that too, kind of pulling them into doing it within a cultural way rather than just on, on, the, on the platform itself, you know, joining, joining a center or joining a dance group or joining something so that they could themselves be put out there on, on social media platforms for them to be seen. Because at the end of the day, a lot of, a lot of the young people want to be seen as well. So they want to be, they want to go viral. They want to, you know, they want to share it and say, oh, look, I was involved in this and all of that. So I think it's kind of like a fusion of the two, kind of bring them together so that it appeals and to, to, both, to both sets of people, the older people like myself and the younger people who are very much interested and kind of bring us together. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of young people live on these social media platforms. And so uh, sometimes uh, they may not uh, be exposed to that aspect of Grenadian history through a book, or quite frankly, through the school system. Um, now true. we have the now now we have Grenadian history being taught in schools, but that's still relatively new. But they would be exposed uh, to to TikTok. So uh, getting those uh, getting the history alive on these platforms, whether it's TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, um, Be Real, or whatever other platforms that that these young people use. So it's it's good to hear you say that. But um, Francis, I, I want to bring you back here. Uh, because we want to talk about um, bringing theater to a new generation of Grenadians. Of course, a, a major aspect of the survivability of culture has to do with that intergenerational transmission of culture. How would you say that your theater is attempting to keep Grenadian culture alive um, by transmitting it to a younger generation? Well, first of all, I think the week, the monthly Calabash Night productions, we have been seen from time to time as the, the productions are rolled out every uh, first sat last Saturday of, of the month, a younger age group, they are coming. And every one of those they are patrons who, who come to the Calabash Night production, they are amazed and they are telling each other. But what I think is important here too is that they must, conversation because the last results from CXC, I think, no, not I think I know, the theater arts had one 100% one pass mark, and which means that the aptitude of the the students they enjoy the um, the theater arts and it's just not and these are students also who have gotten ten and eleven and twelve subjects who are brilliant students, so which says is an indicator here that theater arts here. Is an interest for them but i think that we have to have this national conversation where we have to look at the curriculum and our mindset that theater is not just there just for entertainment per se but it is has to be treated as a viable industry just as you will have the building construction but as you have any of the other the other uh, um, professions i will also and i know i might not be answering the question directly but just need to say this on 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 air that there have to be a wider discussion among the, 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 the Caribbean where we can use the theater and see it as an industry where we can earn a living. But that has to start also from the top. So like a play like Redemption Time, without some, some attempting to sound as though I am presumptuous or too hearty, that we, there's, there, I'm looking forward to see a system where there, you have a valuable product that can be taken throughout the region. And vice versa, if you have a good product from, from Jamaica, let it come through the region. So we have a continuous flow of productions and thereby our young people, once they are trained, training is important, can see the values that I can earn a living because theater is just not there just for, for entertain, entertainment or the yeah. arts. It has to be looked at as a business. Also, mm -hmm. people have to get it that theater there is there to change lives. We have changed mm -hmm. <laughs> lives based on, on the programs that we're doing because as you know, Kelan, yeah. The sort of teacher that I am is not just the, the, the subject area, but I always believing in touching or my students' lives through my teaching. I mean, we have had, had the, the testimony from guys who went to prison and they came back after 25 years and says, Mr. Peters, thank you very much. My life has changed. I'm not I'm out of prison for 25 years. So we have to look at it as a way of changing life and infiltrating the communities because 1980s, when I came back from Jamaica, 1990s, we used to take the play throughout the entire, the entire island, including Karakou. But right now, it is so very difficult to produce theater in Grenada, in the Caribbean, that if we do not have that buy-in, and we do not have policies whereby we have support for taking these um, 
producing these productions, theater yeah. is, is going to die. So there have to be that national um, conversation to know how important the art is, because especially yeah. in these tough economic times and social times, is art is the best way to teach, the best way to influence people. And I know that young people, based on the conversations that I'm having here, the interest is there more and more that we are getting calls. And I'm looking forward with great expectations to have that conversation and to see that if we can start a process whereby <laughs> to use the theater and the drama to start that community um, interaction. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And you make a very important point there, yeah. uh, uh, Uncle Yuyu, about mm -hmm. art and, and, and the role that art plays in uh, keeping young people, giving young people a positive outlet. We can yeah. think of Steel Pan as one example. Mm -hmm. uh, we can think of the choirs in Grenada, whether it's the National Folk Group or Spice Island Youthquake, yes? Um, yes. With, with, with the late Elsia Ferguson, may your soul rest in peace. And, uh -huh. and, and other avenues for art, you mean what you do, what um, yeah. uh, 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 Chris De Riggs does. Mm -hmm. um, talk about uh, the play that you're doing and other plays as learning tools. How do we incorporate uh, drama and the, the and, and the theater arts into the school curriculum? I, I always imagine, for example, a cultural studies curriculum in Grenadian schools and Caribbean schools uh, where, um, you know, uh, as I learned, as I learned at the T. Marisha Community College drama, right? But that wow. drama would be surrounding a particular play that depicts a particular period in history as what this upcoming play will be doing. How do we wow. incorporate that into our school systems? Well, first of all, I think every teacher, I mean, because there's a slight difference between that's the pure theater arts and drama and education. But I think that every teacher who, whether you go to TM Irish or Community College, should do a course in drama in education. And drama in education is a method whereby you use a dramatic mode in order to inspire students to learn. Like I know when I, for instance, my little granddaughter at one time, she was having a little difficulty in spelling certain words and all i simply do is to use a creative methods that if the word is c-l-o-s-c -E, to close i close the cupboard and i put the word on the door and i say what word it is and is the cupboard and she identified the cupboard the cupboard is closed I, she has to spell open o-p-e-n i open the cupboard door so all of these sort of um, simple methods you can do use to inspire students to um to learn for instance if the child doesn't want to read let's say there's a literature book you can go to the class and just say listen here we have to film a movie and you're the class, you are the favorite, you are the outstanding actors and actresses, but you first of all have to do a study of what the story is about and we will have to cast the story. So that inspired them to go and read the book. So first of all, I say is that you have to have drama in education. I know that, um, Dr. Roger Williams, he has done his studies in uh, drama in education, theater arts, and he's a very, very good person in that. I also did that. But we also have to invest in training. Training is important. And when people are trained, not to just bring them back and become public servants, but they have to be out in the school system, in, in the other communities, and within the groups to implement the knowledge that they have. Because so many times in the Caribbean, people go to train and you come back and they put them in the school um, to be teachers and to, in the ministry. And I don't think that that, um, that has worked. So first of all, we have to in, ensure that, again, another conversation. But again, when I write, I address issues. As you say here, the Redemption Time deals with that, the October period or the 1979 to 1983 period. And I've also done so, so many plays. For instance, there's a play called Mayhem in Paradise, which looks at the whole, whole issue of land holdings, um, people being enticed to, to, to sell the lands. To this. And at the end of the, the day, the money finishes when you, when you sell off your lands. But there is no land eventually for you to stand on. As you can look at Grenada and other Caribbean countries, we are think that development is just concrete. And how much more quick can you put on a small island? So that play deals with the whole importance of holding on onto property and the whole issue of the environment. We are getting ready to stage a play called What's Your Verdict? The whole issue on incest is a courtroom drama, again, which we are taking to the four or five communities here. So as I say, it's very important and a very, very, very powerful, for powerful tools to teach and also to address the social issues. And that is what I do mm -hmm. with mixing the entertainment and the education um, elements. But at the same yeah. time, it's about bringing about change and touching people's lives for a better society because we are into a lot, a lot, a lot of problems. Yeah. 
social Absolutely. issues. Yeah. So social uh, challenges, lots of yeah. social challenges that, that that's happening uh, now. Oh, uh, yeah. that there is there is a sea change, and I believe uh, mm -hmm. theater arts and, and and other aspects of the arts are such critical. Uh -huh. Uh, outlets uh, for um, youth development. Now, Francis, talk to us about where patrons uh, can get tickets, uh, the dates of the play. I know that, for example, that GoToFet, uh, that yes. website has tickets for it, but uh, oh, wow. uh, where else can patrons get tickets and um, what weekends, what dates are we talking about in okay. October? Well, from this week, they'll be able to get tickets from Grenada and Optical, both at St. George's, Melville Street, and um, Spiceland Mall. And the play starts at, on the 20th, that's Friday the 20th of, of October, and runs every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at Labocan Creative Center. Fridays and Saturdays, we start at 8 p.m., and on Sundays, 6 p.m., so people who want to bring out their, their parents, their older parents who have enough time, it's early. And we close on, on November the 5th. I'm sure you're going to have, have a, a call for the repeat of, of, the, of the production. So that's where the tickets are outlet at and go to fit. The tickets have been sold already. And we promise our patron the high standard. We have at Labucan. There it's a very intimate space, just 80 people that we hold. So it's important here that people call to book and get the tickets um, beforehand. And we have the lighting, we have uh, adapted the stage, the set is almost up already. And as usual, we are very ex excited to share this really very powerful um, theatrical production. We call it a treat. And I, I'm excited. I've been working with the cast. They have been given. We, in fact, when we finish here, we get them ready to head down to a rehearsal <laughs> just um, after lunch. So again, yeah. they'll be looking forward to the, for the support from the general public. And we promise you the high standard, the quality, the intrigue, the suspense, the magic that will be staged over the past, over the next um, three weekends, starting from October 20th, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Giselle, I, I, I would bring you back uh, for some uh, any closing comments you want to offer um, to uh, the Grenadian public uh, who wants to uh, uh, patronize uh, this very important play at such a historic time in Grenadian history. Sure, you know, I think that is very important that as many people as possible try to attend. I know that it's going to be impossible for everybody to make it. We are running for three weeks, but like he said, it's a very intimate space. But do try to come out, get your tickets very early, and you are going to be in for performances of a lifetime. We have been working very, very hard, and not just to, you know, um, be actors of the various characters, but to actually embody the characters that were written and try to bring that experience home to you as much as possible in the most realistic ways. Um, Uncle Urias has been working very diligently with all of us, the younger actors and actresses, to, you know, just remember certain details about acting itself, the technical parts. So we've been working hard and we want to make sure that you have the best experience possible. So I'm employing you, make sure to come out, bring out the younger folks too, because yeah. a lot of the other persons, they know what happened. Some of them experienced it. And this is just, you know, reliving something, you know, that part. But there are some people who they just have no idea what happened they know that it, it occurred but they don't know the intricacies and and what what it was like for persons living at, around that time so bring out the young people as well and you know, encourage them to look into it and then study further because it really does open your eyes to the happenings of, of that time and even when you want to learn a little bit more you go and you find out you know speak to people and you know get involved a little bit so i that's that's my final words on this Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I, I'll bring back Uncle Yu Yu. I, I call you Uncle Yu Yu. That's, that's how I refer to you as well. Excellent. But clearly, that's not only me. <laughs> so, uh, this morning uh, with, with Giselle. Um, but uh, let's get uh, there is a viewer comment, um, uh, Francis, that I want you to respond to. Uh, the viewer is saying, uh, Mr. Peters, I agree with all the things you're saying, but to be successful, you may want to have to involve the diaspora community and all the theater we're hearing is based only in Grenada. We in the diaspora have to come home to watch these plays while we're going to Jamaican plays in the diaspora from Jamaica, example, mm -hmm. Oliver Samuel. Uh -huh. Essentially, I uh -huh. think what Mr. Antonio mm -hmm. is asking is, would there be a tour? Would there be a diaspora tour of this play? <laughs> there is talk. I think that the play is a genuine Grenadian story. is 40 years. And I think... A tour is absolutely necessary. One of the cast members did uh, intimate that it is a Grenadian story. And so it is also can be used as a 
a tourism product that's come to Grenada and uh, it can be used to get people to come back. So yes, we can have the discussion. I mean, quite actually, you know, having a tour, the financial support and all the other things that go to, um, into a tour, it's, 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 it is challenging. So we have yeah. to get the support and have to have a plan. Maybe talk to the border, to the you know, um, tourism authority, the other relevant authorities and see how we can put plans maybe for a tour next year, maybe England, Canada and the United States once the yeah. actors are available. I think it is, it is very, very timely. Because we, yeah, have, we have yeah. done tours. I mean, Oliver Samuels, as a matter of fact, acted in the burial of Miss Faithland was in 2003. And the Jamaicans mm -hmm. and the Grenadians came out. There was, productions was sold out everywhere we went. So I think it's a very, very good thought, Brother Anthony, mm -hmm. that we are going to definitely have that on our list of priorities there. Yep, yep. Uh, uh, any final comments, uh, Francis? And Giselle? Uh, well, well, first of all, I want to thank you very much for giving us the platform, um, Kellon and Dr. Bob. I want to be very grateful for the work that you're doing and for giving us that, that um, visibility. It's so very important. And mm -hmm. to let the public know that, as Giselle would have said, it's, we are in for a treat. It's ed educational. It's entertaining. It's exciting. The bottom line, line of theater, it's um, entertainment. And we, we just very look forward to continuing this, this process. And uh, come to Labukan. <laughs> you're going to have fun. <laughs> and we're looking forward for the for for the the, the support from the public. Absolutely, uh, Francis Uraz Peters and Giselle Carrington here uh, discussing uh, their play Redemption Time, uh, which will be uh, screened uh, for the next uh, for 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 three weekends in October against the backdrop of uh, the historic events of October nineteenth, nineteen eighty three, in which uh, Grenadian Prime Minister at the time Maurice Bishop and members of his cabinet and other civilians uh, in Grenadian life uh, were tragically killed in that uh, difficult and dark October period. And of course, Redemption Time uh, really speaks to um, that historic period. Of course, this year as well is the first time since uh, those, that tragedy that the government of Grenada, the NDC administration in Grenada, has declared October 19th a public holiday and uh, to be declared as National Heroes Day in commemoration of those we have lost and in honor of all of Grenada's national heroes. So what we will do now, viewers and listeners, is we will take a quick break and come back with a very important conversation on uh, chasing elusive oil dreams. Please stand by for that. We'll be right back. Hi, everyone. Thanks for checking out the Bob Report social media pages. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch our weekly live show, Follow our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram pages, and also subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can catch repeat episodes on Wednesdays at 4 and 5 p.m. respectively on CRFM Radio and GBN TV in Grenada. We are also viewed on Sundays at 8 p.m. on WPG10 throughout the Caribbean. Thanks for watching. Should your loved ones pass on? They deserve to be treated with dignity. And at S.A. Johnson Funeral Home, we can provide you with that service. We can take you every step of the way during your sorrowful moments. When that need arises, call S.A. Johnson Funeral Home at 347-777-9797. That's 347-777-9797. S.A. Johnson Funeral Home is a Caribbean family-owned funeral home here in Brooklyn, providing funeral services, but in a dignified way. From cremation to burial, to the repatriation of your loved ones, you don't have to go through the hassle, as we provide exceptional service that allows you to mourn and heal peacefully. For more information, visit our website, www.sajohnsonfuneral.org. Send us an email at sajfuneral at aol.com or call 347 777-9797. S.A. Johnson Funeral Home, because you deserve to be treated with dignity.
sisters and brothers, one well. We have several more, several more wells which are even more exciting than the one they just found. In other words, Grenada can be a massive supplier of oil and gas. Based on the program of work that we have now developed and identified, we can say that it is the intention of both governments to go to market jointly with a block for exploitation for exploration as early as March of next year. This would mark a very historic step in the history of our country because this would be Grenada's official entry into the oil and gas industry. At this point, I am not very hopeful that you will see a serious investor starting to drill again immediately until he's satisfied that the output of his investment will be in his interest. Viewers and listeners, welcome back to the second segment of this week's edition of The Burb Report. Now, we are going to have a conversation in this second segment about oil and gas and the accountability in relation to public documentation where those that is concerned. Now, on the heels of the government of Grenada's recent announcement of a probe into the island's oil and gas documentation, we have decided to examine how elusive matters related to oil and gas are not only in the context of Grenada, but happens in the context of other Caribbean countries as well. We have three panelists who will make sense of these transparency and accountability challenge. We have Dr. Vincent Adams. He's a former Ghanese national cricketer. He rose to become a petroleum expert advising the former Guyana government on matters of oil and gas exploration. He also ran the day-to-day -day operations of the U.S. government in the Department of Energy. He's also a distinguished engineer at the University of Guyana that led to the establishment of the Petroleum Engineering Department at the institution. He was also the inaugural head of Guyana's Environmental Protection Agency. We are also joined by Mr. Harvey Panker, who is a Surinamese journalist that penned an article in the Caribbean Investigative Journalism Network titled, Oil Secrets of Suriname, Public Largely in the Dark as Offshore Dreams Deferred. He is also the president of the Association of Caribbean Media Workers, as workers and an experienced journalist with a demonstrated history of working in the broadcast and media industry. Last but not least, we have Mr. Anselm Clowden. He's a Canadian-trained Grenadian maritime attorney with a vast knowledge of matters of law of the sea and hydrocarbon resources. He was part of Grenada's boundary and delimit delimitation talks under the previous 2008 to 2013 NDC administration. Uh, panelists, welcome to the Bob Report. Mr. Clouden, I'm aware that you may be having some internet challenges, but we are going to try and be patient with that uh, because we really want to hear what you have to say, Mr. Clouden. And I consider this panel a, a star-studded panel, really, because all of you are experts on, on this matter. But, but I want to begin, uh, gentlemen, uh, by putting this conversation into a particular context. Would it be fair to say that uh, Caribbean countries who... Uh, have found or, 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 or who uh, might be finding uh, uh, um, hydrocarbon resources within their territorial waters are cutting their noses to spike their faces in the interest of ensuring that corporate interests uh, are able to help us with our oil exploration prospects. Who, wa who wants to take that question first? Mr. Clouden? <laughs> Uh, we, we're not hearing we're not hearing you there sir uh we, we're not hearing you uh we you may have to unmute the mic um are you hearing me now Dr. i'm Bob? hearing you loud and clear now sir go right ahead <laughs> very well dr bob let me thank you yes. for having me on and so distinguished uh, and sensitive an issue yes because it's, it affects the caribbean generally mm -hmm. not only the archipelago geographically but with respect to hydrocarbon deposits throughout the length and breadth of the limited and on yet to be the limited maritime boundaries. Mm -hmm. So I think you're right in some respects. Mm -hmm. um, 
what has happened between Grenada and Trinidad with respect to the introduction of um, extra regional business uh, um, entrepreneurs such as the Russians um, have no doubt resulted in an inertia here in Grenada that we can not explore and exploit the rich um, hydrocarbon resources of our delimited boundaries. That, that's my take on it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'm going to bring in uh, uh, Dr. Adams. Dr. Adams, uh, what's your take on uh, that opening context that, that that I laid on the table, sir? Hey, thank. First of all, thanks for for having me, Dr. Bob, and a nice, nice, you know, having a conversation with your distinct, distinguished guest. And mm -hmm. um, you know, I've never heard it put put the way that you did, but it might be you know very appropriate to to con to put it in that context of we cutting our nose to spoil our face. Um, what has happened and and you know and I I I've not been following the 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 Grenada entering into in getting into oil and, and oil exploration of Grenada. So I could I could speak for what I know has happened to Guyana and other countries um that I had the opportunity to be engaged or involved in. Um what, what happened in Guyana, for example, in Grenada, I, my, 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 my best advice to Grenada and most worthwhile advice is to, is to have, take the lessons learned from Guyana mm -hmm. with the issues that, that we were encountering here. Um, and what happened was, I was, you know, there was exploration in Guyana, I think, going way back into the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And we never really thought that it would ever come through. So... When oil was finally discovered in 2015, we were so giddy that we were willing to take anything. Now we are realizing that the contract that was handed upon us, and I, and I recall when oil was discovered in 2016, I was asked by the, the, the minister in charge to review the, the, the contract. And I provided a 12-page document based on my experience and dealings um, internationally with these oil companies and, 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 and contracts. And what was told to me is that I was being too tough on Exxon and will drive Exxon out of the country, uh, which I had to retort that, you know, I bet my life that that would never happen. Mm -hmm. Well, we ended up now, we have ended up with getting 14 and a half percent, 14 and a half percent. While the, the Exxon and, and its partners, they're taking away 8 to 5.5%. When all was discovered, initially, we thought that we had, we, you know, we, we had reserves of like 3 billion barrels of oil equivalent. Now, it's up to 11 billions and counting. We expect it might get closer to 20. Mm -hmm. And in the contract, what was interesting, in the contract, it says, it allows for renegotiating that contract. And with such a major change condition, you are, you know, you would think that the government would immediately say, hey, you know, I want to relook at this contract. But for whatever reason, we are not even bringing it up or even approaching the, 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 the company. And the government in, in, who's in the, you know, the, the current government, when the current government was in opposition, they lambasted. The, the previous government went that we were always discovered under, they said that every Guyanese should be sad at every single discovery um, because the government has sold out our patrimony and Exxon is ripping us off. And as soon as we get into office, we will renegotiate this contract. And guess what? They got into office now and they're, they're declaring that the contract is, 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 a, is sanctity. We cannot touch the contract. So those are the kinds of things. And then there's no transparency whatsoever. Mm -hmm. The government is even siding with Exxon to go against its own laws and, and, and regulations that we could get to later that, that I, when I took over the EPA, that I put in place to make sure that we protected in terms of insurance and to cover any kind of liability coverage, any type of, you know, um, to clean up a spill if it occurs because... If a spill occurs in Guyana, it's not only Guyana, it can wash the entire Caribbean um, away, um, all the tourism and everything else. 
So it's a, it's a very serious matter. And when, remember, these are offshore developments. So it's not about, you know, Guyana or Grenada or Suriname. If you have something that, that, if you have a spill, it could impact the entire economy and bankrupt a lot of countries within the Caribbean. So those are the lessons learned. Audit, for example, you've got a major scandal ongoing right now with an audit that I can get into some details later. Mm -hmm. But we must, the most important thing is, the most important thing is, Grenada, there has to be, there must be strong institution before you even start producing a barrel of oil. Strong institution for oversight. Um, before you start producing a barrel of oil, don't wait on the backside when you start producing oil because, you know, you're so anxious and excited to get the oil that, you know, whatever is presented to you, take it. And then afterwards, you start realizing, oh, shucks, you know, I'm down in this world. Now, the only thing I can call it is a sanctity of contract. I can't touch it, which is a big mm -hmm. excuse, by the way. So that's mm -hmm. my take for now until... Yeah. On yeah, yeah, absolutely, uh, Mr. Panka. I will bring you in here. I, I see you. I see you smiling. But, but I, I want to uh, cite from the article that you published in uh, the Caribbean Investigative um, News Network, uh, Investigative uh, Journalism Network, um, and 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 the title of that article was "Oil Secrets of Suriname: Public Largely in the Dark as Offshore Dreams Deferred." It it kind of reminds me. Mr. Clouden, of, of what might be happening in Grenada now, that we have all of these oil <laughs> secrets. So, for example, for example, uh, John Ogeest, uh, Mr. Ogeest, who is a, a retired uh, energy official in the Ministry of Energy, said he has a gag order. He can't talk about uh, uh, any, any agreement or any arrangement that Grenada had with uh, any of the, the, the oil companies. Uh, Mr. Bowen, uh, who was a former Minister of Energy, said the same thing. But Mr. Panker, let us talk about that. It appears as if what might be happening in Suriname uh, might be what is also happening in Grenada. Uh, please set that up for us, please, to tell us the, the case of Suriname. Yes, you need to unmute, sir. Just unmute the microphone there. Uh, yes. Yes, go ahead, sir. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Bob, for having me. And uh, yes. good morning to other panelists. Yes, uh, what's, it's what I experienced also during my investigation that uh, you're, you will uh, get to a lot of closed doors where you're looking for uh, information. Mm -hmm. When they all say on public podia that it's uh, all the information should be accessible, it's public uh, information, but when you need the information, when you ask for the information, you never get it. They will always defer you, defer you to till yeah, it's time for you to publish your article. But uh, the, um, um, according to politicians, according to the state-owned uh, oil company, all would be public information, mm -hmm. but still no information. Mm -hmm. Even if you contacted those uh, bigger uh, oil companies, the foreign oil companies directly, they won't give you the information. They would uh, say that uh, you have to get the information from starts only. They will play a ping pong with you, but you have to. This, but I think in the end, it's a game they're playing to get you tired so that you won't go further with your investigation. But to 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 come back, um, the title of the article was that. Uh, 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 the, the past years, it was still that when, when the big oil wells were discovered, that the, the, the final investment decision was still deferred, 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 deferred. And every time someone from the oil company or from, from, from the Exxon or whoever would come and say, yes, the, 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 the oil that we found in the well was not sufficient, to, 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 to bring up those big production ships. So we have to, to do some more exploration and exploration, exploration. And in the end, now, um, not so long ago, uh, the final investment decision was made mm -hmm. that it will be um, the end of next year, mm -hmm. December, 2024. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I got a feeling that 
um, they are playing some political game with us. You know, the, 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 we have elections in 2025. Mm -hmm. And it seems a little suspicious to me that the final investment decision will be made a few months before the elections. <laughs> I don't want to see out loud that yeah. it is. Uh, it, it has to be that date, but something not so right because they don't put the information that out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and and Mr. Clouden, uh, speaking of not putting information out there, I mean, in, in the throne speech, uh, we heard uh, what uh, the the Governor General said in respect of. Uh, government's findings or lack thereof how do you react to um and of course you have been calling for there to be um uh some action on on, on this matter shall we say but how do you react to uh, these latest developments in the context of grenada it, it seems to continue to be elusive i, I was surprised that they're saying that they cannot find any files at all <laughs> mr clouden um Dr. Bob, do you yes. wish me to comment on, I hadn't laid the, the foundation yes. in answer to your question with respect yes. to Grenada and the calamitous yes. situation we are now in. Yes, now, now, uh, absolutely. Lay the foundation, please. Yes. As to what had happened before. Yeah. Pardon me, doctor? Yes, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Cloud. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Hearing you. No, yes. th th there was a treaty in, in, in 2010. The delimitation of a single maritime boundary between the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago and Grenada. Now, in furtherance of that, the signing and, and uh, the uh, um, ratification of the treaty, there was a framework agreement between the government of Trinidad and Tobago and the government of Grenada concerning cooperation in the energy sector. And it was quite a detailed agreement. Uh, for example, Article 1 of this agreement, and this agreement was signed and also ratified by the government. There was a signing ceremony in the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago where both the agreement, the addendum, and the framework to which I have now referred was properly executed by the then Prime Minister, Tillman Thomas. Mm -hmm. But Article 1 speaks to the level of cooperation anticipated between both governments. He said this agreement, this agreement, Article 1, aim of framework agreement. This agreement establishes a process through which the parties agree to cooperate with each other in the development of the energy sector of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago and Grenada. And it goes on to outline the forms of cooperation in Article 4 in a rather detailed fashion. I say all that to say that the, the board, the joint commissions had contemplated um, a joint development because of the strategic location of two blocks one which which straddled one straddled the boundary itself so that you had a one third the line passed through block 21 there was an oil rig on block 22 and that um block 21 was a subject of joint exploitation um one third two thirds one third to grenada two thirds to trinidad and tobago given the configuration of the line itself Mm -hmm. So that all agreements were signed and, and, and uh, the energy uh, department in Grenada was about to negotiate for joint exploitation. Until, of course, you had difficulty with the Tillman Thomas administration. You had Peter David and the others, um, the, the energy minister. They created um, an impasse, so a political impasse, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Then... Of course, in 2013, the NMP came in. Well, you see, some time ago, Dr. Mitchell, in, in some previous administration, of which he headed, had accepted 
a stone, a ruby, um, as evidence of First International Bank um, sufficiency to engage in international banking. Well, you know what? How calamitous that was. Actually, actually, the, the, it was a, a picture, a, a picture of a ruby. <laughs> yes, indeed. So, so that they wanted again, and, and it was rather um, ridiculous to have gone to these um, the Russians. And I had a deal, and I sued one of them on behalf of another director, part of the whole group, um, on the guys that there was. The money wasn't as clean as initially anticipated. And uh, the company in Belize, which was a subsidiary of the company with which the government of Grenada negotiated, was literally a shell company. Mm -hmm. it, it had no assets and the like. So that it is rather interesting, having regard to the war in Ukraine and certain sanctions that are imposed on uh, Russian business at um, activities in this region, we can hardly expect any exploration or exploitation to be taking place for the next decade. Um, and in mm -hmm. any event, the Russians are not able because they, have, as I understand it, have gone on to advertise and to raise money to exploit the resources. The, mm -hmm. the, the, question to be asked now is where is that contract and to what extent they have jurisdiction jurisdiction was as it were delegated to them to exploit the resources of our zone without necessarily enforcing the agreement we have had with Trinidad and Tobago and let's let me we break for a little while remember the Russians had to negotiate with Trinidad that um natural gas outfit there, there was a cooperative agreement an, an mm -hmm. agreement for cooperation between the russian interests and the the, the natural gas interests in trinidad and tobago where mm -hmm. is all that information um this government <laughs> this government has not been advised they have not seen the contracts so that where are we now with respect to the exploitation of our wealth. Mm -hmm. It is the well, state of Grenada's wealth. It isn't Mitchell yeah, well, or Bowen's wealth. Right, correct. But Sorry. but 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 Mr. Cloud, but Mr. Cloud, uh, Mr. Gregory Bowen's theory of the case on his appearance on uh, on an NNP platform uh, last week on the Talking Points program, uh, he said that uh, it is not the case that none of that information is not available. In fact, he he is he's contending that if the government wants uh, to find him, they know where to find him in respect of that information because they have done so in the past. And he's saying that there are uh, particular checks and balances within the public service in respect of record keeping. So he's not buying the claim that the government is making that, that, that there is no documentation on that. In fact, he goes on to say further that this is a political red herring. What say you? Of course not. This is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. When one administration takes over from another administration, all relevant documents to the administration of government business must be properly transferred or handed over to the incoming administration. And it, it, it really bugs me that, look, documents that relate to the economic development of the country, the country's natural resources of its exclusive economic zone cannot be found. Well, I don't think we have a prime minister now that is a man of great distinction, great honor, very honest, um, very beloved by his people, he would not mislead the nation into believing that there's a document somewhere and, and uh, he can't put his hand on it or that he was, the documents are there. These documents are not Bowen's documents or Keith Mitchell documents, that's state documents. And therefore they constitute top security because it relates to the, 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 the 
state's resources. Uh, and therefore, the only alternative open to the government now is to commence a criminal investigation against former Prime Minister Mitchell and Gregory Bowen as to the whereabouts of those documents. That's what has to be done. So, so are, are you saying, uh, and Dr. Adams, I'm going to bring you back here shortly, mm -hmm. but, but, but are you saying, uh, Mr. Clouden, that this should be in the hands of uh, the, the Director of Public Prosecution and the FIU? Of course it should. Okay. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat um, concerned that it hasn't reached there yet. And Mitchell and Bowen have been taken up and brought in for questioning. These are state okay. secrets. But what has yeah, happened yeah, yes. to the United States so, with President Trump? Yes, absolutely. But but Former what would Trump. be the point? What would it? What would be the point then of establishing a separate committee led by former Energy Minister and former Finance Minister Nazem Burke? If you're saying that this should be uh, reposed uh, in the hands of uh, uh, the investigative unit of law enforcement, do you believe that well, it's, it was necessary to set up that committee? Of course. Well, I don't think it was necessary at all. Okay. But uh, uh, the Prime Minister, in his wisdom, um, has initiated uh, the committee. Um, and uh, let's see what the committee would, would discover. Mm -hmm. but, but this is a, an investigatory matter. Mm -hmm. It's a criminal matter. State documents with respect to the wealth of the nation cannot just disappear in thin air. There must have been custodians of these documents, mm -hmm. these contracts, the treaty, the framework agreement, as I have alluded to. Where are yeah. they? Look at what mm -hmm. happened in the United States with President Trump and also former President Trump and now President Biden. Certain top secret documents were taken from the government offices into their private domain. Well, the FBI went after them. President, former President Trump is now charged for retaining those documents. I mean, I don't know why we haven't been taking a more uh, um, coercive route with respect to the recovery of so important mm -hmm. The most important documents in the country now mm -hmm. must be related to the country's resources and the development of those resources. What has happened yeah. to the agreement with Trinidad and Tobago? Have they abrogated that agreement? Or was the Russians faced to deal with Trinidad and Tobago with respect to the natural gas because in light of the framework agreement? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but okay. there's a lot to be questions to be asked, and the only answer you can get is through a criminal investigation, as was done in the United States. Yeah, and, and absolutely. That's what the democracy yeah, yeah, yeah. is all about. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, Mr. Clouden, stick a pin there. I, I want to bring back uh, Dr. Adams here now. Dr. Adams, in in the context of Guyana, of course, before Guyana uh, found um, uh, that uh, significant. A, 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 a pool of oil within its, its its territorial space. Talk to us about a, a, accountability frameworks before that. Uh, were people uh, aware or, or, or were people uh, kept in the loop with respect to uh, uh, agreements uh, and, and contracts and arrangements that, that, that Ghana was uh, getting itself involved in with, uh, with with the oil companies? And what did that look like? No, no. <laughs> The, the, the answer to your question is is an absolute no. And it's coming back to bite us in you you know where. Mm -hmm. And I think the everybody are recognizing it at this time. And that that is why that is why I say the 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 most the most important recommendation and advice that I would give to, to, to Grenada is is to make sure you have strong institutions in place before. You even start um, producing a barrel of oil. The other thing, as part of be, transparency, has become a major issue in Guyana. As uh, if, you know, I don't know if you folks have been following what's going on here, but lots of scandals, um, and it's because of that simple reason that we were not prepared. And when it hit, when it hit us in 2015, we were so giddy to to to, to produce oil so that the country could suddenly become rich that we were willing to, to turn a blind eye to, to everything in the past. But, but it's not only that. 
it's a it's dangerous when you don't know what you don't know and and, and part of building these 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 strong institutions is to make sure that you've got the right people on board mm -hmm. um one of the things you see these oil companies they come in and i've i had to, to, to i speak about it all the time and write about it all the time somehow we still live as if we're still under this colonial era where we look at these folks these big companies they come in with their sweet talk as if they're interested in us they're not interested in the country or the people they're interested in our in in what we have to make sure that we can fill their pockets and when it's done they're gone all can only last like in Guyana. all will only be there for about 20 or 30 years mm -hmm. we've got to figure out what do we do after you know to put in place uh, and to make sure that they operate in such a way that we leave a sustainable economy and, and environment when they're gone. But they come in and we take whatever they say as gospel because we don't have anybody on our side to counter anything that they say. And we're intimidated by whatever they say. We were afraid to even ask them questions. And that is why in terms of that institution that I talk about, in this, we should have, in the case of Grenada, um, there should be, uh, this is just a lessons learned from Guyana. I, I told you when I was asked to, to be part of that, re, uh, reviewing that contract, um, it was ignored because Exxon said, this is what they want, this is what's there, and we went along with it. My advice to Grenada is to have, make sure you have the right expertise, petroleum engineers, for example, and you can make sure that I would, Get, you know, you start for us to see, are there any native Grenadians out there who are qualified because their heart and soul will be in their country? Or else you, then you got to go go with these hired guns who are already tied up and working for these petroleum companies. So there's mm -hmm. immediately a conflict of interest. So you have to start with building that institution before you produce a barrel of oil. Or else you're going to try to correct it in the backside and it's going to have gone too far. But transparency is a key problem that is now turning around and we're realizing um, that we did not have the institutions in place or we didn't even have a plan. So whatever the company Exxon came in and told us to do, that's what we're doing. And it has become now worse with the change of government because they mm -hmm. turned what they were saying they were going to be doing. They had identified these as issues and now they're in office. Then, of course, Exxon, a lot of people, I for one, say that that you can um, practically say that Exxon is, is running the country because they're calling the shots. They're taking down all of the guardrails that was in place. You know, like, for example, and I, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, not that I want to take credit for anything, but, you know, I work to the highest level of U.S. government with these companies and I know how they operate. I know what strong institutions are. So those are the kinds of things that I put in place in my short tenure at, at the Environmental Protection Agency and advising the government on petroleum. And they knew that they had to abide with it. They had agreed they were abiding by everything that we were putting in place. And as soon as I left and the government changed, the new current government, despite what they were saying in the past, they're turning all of that on top of its head. There were some court cases that the government is siding with Exxon against its own people. You know, appealing the even though the judge ruled in favor of the, the litigants, now the government of Guyana is siding with Exxon against its own people and against its own laws. And, you know, it, it, of course, these companies, they're looking after their interests. No question. Their interest is the bottom line, and they're going to do anything ruthlessly to, regardless of what it takes, for them to, to, to fill their pockets. That's their only interest. And we have to make sure that we have whatever it takes in place also for us to protect our interests. And they understand that. But if they see that you, you, you're you weak, they're going to take advantage of that. And that's exactly what is happening, Diana. And I guarantee you what I'm hearing here is exactly probably what's happening in Grenada. And we and this is the time to fix it before it gets to the point that we're, what is happening in Guyana now is uh, lots of scandals. Well, just quickly, there was an audit here recently now the contract called for doing an audit every you know, within two years and if you don't do it in two years forget about it well they did an audit 
the easiest of the audit, the very first audit, it was the easiest of the audit, a $1.76 billion audit in cost. Mm -hmm. Exxon charged us $214 million, $214 million of charges that did not exist. The previous government had already put, went and hired an international company to come in. They have found that Exxon was overcharging $214 million. The new government came in and suddenly this 214 went down to 3 million. Exxon, if you Exxon say no, it's 3 million. We accepted it and it was being hidden by the government. The same transparency, you know, this, this report was sitting there over two years or so, or two and a half or three years. The report was sitting there with 214 million and it had to be leaked. It had to be leaked. Somebody leaked it, got into the press, and of course, all hell broke loose, and the government suddenly started paying attention. And and so now they on on, on their back feet trying to figure out now they're they they they're blaming some low-level employee in the Ministry of Natural Resources for for being a you know going out there on his own, which is nobody could, would believe that. Um, for for allowing that to happen. So these are the kinds of things that that transparency is a key is a key pillar of of any strong oversight and 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 any democracy. And what I'm hearing here is 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 exactly what 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 we um what we see in Guyana. And and it's not it does not augur as well. For, yeah. for, for mm -hmm. the future. Uh, Mr. Clouden, I, I want you to piggyback on, on, on what Dr. Adams just articulated here. Um, I mean, what he's saying here is that uh, we as, 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 as Grenada should learn from Guyana uh, in, in, in respect of those transparency challenges. I, I concur wholeheartedly with what Dr. Adams has said. My recommendation in casual discussions that look, we should set up a framework to manage the resource, but we don't even have the documentation to know where the location of the resources. I happen to know where block 21 and 22 is because it was the subject of the treaty negotiations, but there's a tremendous amount of, of natural gas. This is why they had gone to Trinidad to deal with the, that's like global petroleum, to deal with the natural gas company there, the, the Trinidad Petroleum Company, um, and they, so they claim they have um, initiated and formed this this um, contract or, or agreement to exploit the natural gas. Well, that mm -hmm. is where our resources lie for exploitation, immediate exploitation. It's on the continental shelf that extends the natural prolongation of the South American uh, 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 geographical configuration right up to on the Point Saline. This is why we had started, well, the, the Bowen administration recognizing where the natural gas deposits were in such huge quantities, started to negotiate with Venezuela. I don't know if there's any evidence in, in the government uh, uh, files showing what initial steps were taken with respect to engaging Venezuela in uh, a delimitation undertaken. Mm -hmm. But the point is well made by Dr. Adams. You must, before you extrapolate oil, even one barrel, so to speak, you must have sound institutions to manage and govern the exploitation itself and mm -hmm. sale and other collateral um, issues and concerns that would arise. Mm -hmm. Let me make the point. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, 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 Dr. Bowen, Adams. Bowen has no let me let me add very quickly here. Again, yes. I, I don't think I can overemphasize the point that exactly just to add to to to, to what uh, Mr. Claudin is saying. The importance of understanding is not only about the documents. When these companies come in to explore, they do not want you to have knowledge of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. That is why it's important upfront, because I saw it in Guyana, like I said, when they asked me to review the contract in 2015, 
Guyana did not have a single qualified petroleum engineer to even know what the document is. So what they do, the politicians make these decisions. And the politicians don't know anything about oil and gas. So guess what they do? They go along hook, line, and sinker with what the big behemoth Exxon is telling them. They're intimidated. So my one, again, another, my advice again, uh, just to, to piggyback on what Mr. Claudio is saying, mm -hmm. in terms of that framework and in terms of understanding what these resources are, you must have, in this particular case, a very good, um, at, at a minimum, a very good petroleum geologist and a very good petroleum engineer to understand what what these these drilling logs are showing you and what all of the data is showing because they're going to tell you what they, they they're going to give you limited information and you know you you don't understand head or tail as to what they're talking about and you just sign up but they're looking after their interest and these companies folks let's face it they cannot be trusted i mean it's proven over and over exxon and the rest of these companies cannot be trusted we have got they, they're in to make money they don't come there because they like us and they want to make us rich they come there to make themselves rich and to exploit whatever we have and you know they use the the they, they go back to to, to 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 the old you know or the old ways of treating us as if you know we're still on the colonialism and we behave that way to go along with everything mm -hmm. we have got to have like i said strong institution and in in grenada's particular case my strongest advice in terms of this framework that Mr. Clown is talking about is to make sure you've got technically qualified people. Petroleum is very new to the Caribbean, except probably for Trinidad. Um, so we don't, it's not a case where we've been training engineers and folks in petroleum engineering, including Guyana and Grenada and the rest of the islands. It's not like civil engineers where you can find a civil engineer. It's a highly specialized area. So I would advise, you know, in, in this, especially in this initial stage, is for us to, to or is for Grenada to go out there and get the highly technical skills to represent them and to interpret the information that they're that that they're bringing to you, rather than just accepting it hook, line, and sinker. Because you're going to get to a point where you're going to realize you make an error, and it's too late to turn back. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Panker, Mr. Cloud, if you wanted to add something, and then I'll bring in Mr. Yeah, Panker yes, here yes, again. Go ahead, Dr. sir. Bob, I, I, yes, I just want to ask, um, Doctor Bob. I, I think it's rather impertinent. Of, of Mr. Bowen to have said that um, the, the Prime Minister knows where to find him and uh, either want to find him. He has no proprietary rights to any document that uh, the government and, and, and the Honorable Prime Minister should come searching to you uh, for you to deliver those documents to, to him. I mean, well, no, you, you I, see why I, it is necessary I, 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 to have a government? No, but I, I don't think that's I, I don't think I don't think he was saying I don't think he suggested that he had any documents. I think the point he was making was that if if, if the government is claiming that they, 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 they cannot find any of the information that perhaps uh, they have reached out to him in the past uh, to assist with, uh, I suppose, his, his expertise and his knowledge on those matters, that they can reach out to him again. I, I don't think he was saying that he has any documentation well, is in his possession. Well, I'm not I saying that, he says that so, but I think the important yes. To, to insinuate mm -hmm. that they should come to him. Those documents ought to have been transferred at the point where they demitted office, and therefore the incoming administration had to be seized of those important documents. Where are they? And he negotiated the contract, I'm advised, with the Russians. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, let me bring in uh, Mr. Panker here again. Now, Mr. Panker, I want to, uh, I'm going to share the screen. I'm going to share um, an article, part of the article that you published in uh, the Investigative Journalism Network. Um, and uh, you talk about, um, you, you said in Suriname, oil bids are conducted largely in secret. Mm -hmm. uh, you go on to say oil contracts and other documentation are kept from the public despite more than six years of government promises to publish them. And freedom of information legislation has been delayed for more than a decade. You go on to say the National Oil Company 
uh, told CJN that it is working to improve transparency and that its bidding process and contracts are largely up to international standards. Similar promises have also come from Suriname, Suriname President Mr. Chan, a former police commissioner who took office in 2020, pledging to reform the corruption that has long plagued the country. Uh, where are we? In, you, you've, you're hearing these conversations here about what's happening in Grenada. Uh, is, is it similar in, in, in the case of Suriname where um, uh, allegations of, of missing documents are the case? What is it like there in relation to... Is, is there a board, for example? Is, is there a regulatory oil board that's responsible for uh, managing uh, uh, how Suriname uh, administers those resources? Yeah, yeah, they, there should be, but most of the, the, those institutions don't function that properly mm -hmm. because all those institutions are also state owned, even as the, the, the state oil company. So it, it, it's, it's the same. And, and what's happening there in Suriname, I, I, want, I want to put this up front because when uh, investigating, writing this article, uh, and I'm listening to Dr. Adams and Mr. Uh, Clowden, I have to say that it's such a shame that we don't have the sufficient fund, that we lack the sufficient fund to explore and extract the oil in the Caribbean. We have to depend on those multinationals. And, you know, as a Caribbean, we have resources. We have information like, for instance, there is Trinidad who has these oil industries for a, a long time now. Yeah. Decades, mm -hmm. yeah. We could join forces as, as Caribbean, as one Caribbean. But, you know, uh, um, like Dr. Adam says and Mr. Clowden, the, 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 the way these multinationals operate, they don't give you all the information. They don't tell you what you need to know. If, and if you yourself, you don't, you can't read the contracts. You don't know what's written in there. They will tell you what they will tell you what they want, and you need to take it. You know, and um, these information. I don't know if, if the state of Suriname knows a lot, or they don't know. But in the end, they don't give the information. You know, in the article, I also have a section when I, when, when, when I talk about uncapped promises. Suriname has been party at the Extractive Industries Transparent, Transparency Initiative, ATI. And it's a North Korea headquartered group of more than 55 countries that have committed to disclosing wide ranging information about their extractive industries, including contracts, licenses, and other documentation. And you know what? Suriname have been suspended two times. <laughs> because they have never kept their promises to publish the, the, this information. And when ask starts only, why not? They couldn't give me a sufficient answer. Why not? ETI never responded on my questions. Mm -hmm. So um, there is nobody is there to even, how you say it, to, to, to can, can, that can, can maybe urge the government to give us the information, to, to make this information public. You know, when I was interviewing Mr. Collins of Guyana, and all what Dr. Adam said, he also said, and he also said that, you know, Suriname mustn't make the same mistake Guyana made. Mm -hmm. You know? We're in the process, you know, at the other hand, uh, uh, Suriname, we had had an oil industry for decades. Now it's offshore, but not, we had an onshore uh, uh, oil industry for since 1980s. Mm -hmm. And when talking to the director of Stats Oli, he said that the past decades, um, Stats Oli contributed like billions of US dollars into the economy of Suriname. But we don't see any of it today, today. And his fear is that when after the final, in, now the final invest, uh, uh, the final decision has been made, investment decision has been made, 
and when uh, the, the, the money will be paid and, and the government will get their money. How do we know that that money will be well spent? What guarantee do we have that that money will be well spent? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and, and, and you know, one other thing, this, this industry is, is, is such a feeding ground for corruption because a lot of information is not made public at all. So we'll, that's why the titles also will public is largely in the dark because I say, I will estimate that we don't know 90% of it. So I don't know what will happen because these multinationals know one thing. They're not here for you, for the country. They will extract the oil. They're all there for, for themselves and the shareholders. They don't have you in their interest. We have to know that. So like Dr. Adams said, we have to have the specialists, the, the, these attorneys, because you know, if, if you have a case, like there's an environmental spill or something, they have like those big uh, attorney companies that can defend them. And who do you have? Who can you pay? You can match up to that. So I think what I learned in this article that we have to be more careful. We have to learn from each other as countries. Like uh, uh, Grenada is in the face now of starting this industry. Mm -hmm. You can learn from Trinidad. You can learn from Suriname. You can learn from uh, 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 Guyana. And, and, and I think if we join forces, I don't think we will beat them, but I think we can establish something that can uphold to these big companies. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I, I want to bring back uh, Mr. Clouden here. Mr. Clouden, um, I, I want you to react to uh, what... Um, uh, our colleague here from uh, Suriname just indicated, what can we learn uh, from Suriname uh, in, in respect of uh, th that lack of transparency there? Uh, th that seems to be a, a universal theme uh, in, in, in one country where uh, the, the industry is, in, in the context of Ghana, is, is moving on, it's, it's moving forward. In another country in the context of Suriname where uh, it's it's sort of midway there, um, but 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 the, the the common theme here is that lack of accountability and transparency, in addition to not knowing what agreements are signed with with, with these organizations with with these multinational uh, oil corporations. Mr. Clouden? Well, I think you're perfectly right, Doctor Bob, and I agree with, with our, uh, my colleague from Suriname, and we are facing a similar predicament on disclosure, um, a lack of transparency, um, and the fact that we, we, we can't move forward. First, we may have to terminate the agreement with the, with the Russians. Uh, there's good grounds for it. Frustration of contract is one such ground that comes to mind. And um, see how we can return to Trinidad because there's more rectitude and transparency with respect to our CARICOM uh, family of nations and uh, Suriname and Guyana, Guyana being the headquarters of CARICOM, I think we have to, to collectively, uh, uh, those of us who are in the business of exploring and exploiting oil and gas, we must move regionally too. And uh, there must be transparency, there must be accountability and, and the like. Because where we are now, what would be our next move? Um, I would suggest uh, that we terminate the contract with the Russians. And there's good reason for it. Um, frustration, the war in Ukraine. They can't uh, do any exploratory drillings and the like here now mm -hmm. <laughs> because it will be contrary to the embargo and we may be punished for so doing. So mm -hmm. There's certain grounds, but you know, I'm speaking out loud as I think. Um, but I agree with my Suriname uh, uh, colleague. We need transparency and accountability that we didn't have in the past administration that negotiated with the Russians. Rather than go to our CARICOM neighbor, where there's a framework and, 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 and a committee set up 
for the explore, joint exploration of oil and gas. We have no technology. We have, as as um, the colleague from from Guyana said, we have no technical expertise, which is indispensable to the exploration and exploitation of hydrocarbons. You need highly specialized people. We don't even have an oil engineer here. So, so that, you know, I think to overcome this difficulty, we have to cooperate. So we learned from Suriname, we sent a delegation to Suriname, we speak to the Surinamese, we speak to the Guyanese, we um, encounter, <coughs> they tell us what their problems are, what problems they have encountered, so we can avoid it here, going into this new area of economic activity for the mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. uh, let me bring in uh, Nigel Grave Sandy here, who is, is a regular uh, viewer of the program. He says, good morning, and I laud the conversation today, and I would wish to posit the following for the panel's comments and reaction. One, isn't it time for the region to situate oil and gas exploration within the context of energy security with the region, with, the region, with a corresponding emphasis on renewable energy? That's the first uh, uh, proposition he's advancing. The second one is, uh, should the region move with urgency to develop universe, uh, uniform regulatory legislation to deal with oil and glass exploration and environmental preservation? And three, um, I believe those are the two. But I, I, I want to get, uh, I, I would start with you, uh, uh, Dr. Adams, on, on, on that, uh, th those propositions advanced by Mr. Grief Sandy. Well, I... And I even when I, I was with the with the Ghana government, I was one of those who, who've been calling, and I've, I've worked with some other Caribbean organizations, um, calling for, for example, when you do an environmental impact assessment in Guyana, or the other Caribbean countries should be involved. That environmental impact assessment is the, is, is the assessment, is the only detailed document that does all of the studies as to the impact, let's say, of, of, of an oil spill. That oil spill is not going to impact Guyana alone. As a matter of fact, based on the current flow and everything and based on the models that have been run, it's probably going to not even, it's going to clear Guyana shore um, to a certain extent. Trinidad, for example, would be wiped completely out. One of the first countries and some other countries all the way to 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 to, uh, to 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 Jamaica. So I have always called for that integrated effort to come up with regional regulations, especially when you're going and drilling offshore. The 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 boundaries, your 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 geographic boundaries doesn't see where the wind, you know, they don't care about the wind, you know, direction and that type of stuff. It those things cross boundaries. Those boundaries are just created there by man. Nature does not operate that way. If you have a spill, that current, that water is going to go any place where, where, where nature takes it, and which means it impacts the entire the rest of the Caribbean. So absolutely, I think there ought to be, um, especially in terms of, of, of environmental impacts, um, because it will be a serious economic. It's not, a lot of people... We, you know, look at the environmental stuff as well. It's, it's just uh, something on the side. If we have a spill in the Caribbean, folks, it would wipe out the entire economy, potentially wipe out the economy of, 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 the, of, of a lot of the Caribbean countries. It would go, it would go even the shores of Venezuela. And, if you, and you know, we've got issues, Guyana has issues with Venezuelan borders and stuff like that. Um, and if you want to really tick them off to give them an excuse to probably, even, you know, um, invade Guyana, and that would be one of those. So without question, now the what was the first question again? Um, uh, yes. So so the, the the first one has. Uh, let let me let me put it up again because uh, I believe that comment. Yes. So he said, uh, should the region move with urgency to develop universe uniform regulatory legislation to deal with oil and gas exploration? Yes, and and I think it had the renewable energy in there too. It had to renewable move. energy, correct? Yes, right, and that's also yes. been something. oil and gas exploration within the context of energy security. Absolutely, yes. absolutely, and, and and of course we're you know we're in the dilemma where we're now you know the entire world is moving towards renewable when those big and powerful countries they became rich because of the fossil industry. 
Yeah. And now here we've got an opportunity. So we cannot just give up our opportunity to be uh, to, to at least have that money, you know, to, to develop our economy. If the money goes where it should be going, by the way. So I've always been a big advocate for utilizing the money that we gain from that we 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 the revenues that come from oil and gas to invest in renewable and trans and tra, you know just to, to, to transition into renewable energy um for the long term but at the same time we've got to 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 to, to keep keep the, the the potential of 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 generating revenues from 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 fossil fuel that's what the that's how the major companies that's how the major countries became rich and we cannot must not be denied however we have to do it responsibly invest that money in those renewable resources um rather than you know in Guyana for example here's another lesson and I think of my colleague from from Suriname um mentioned um alluded to to, 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 to this here in terms of where the money is going one of the big major issues in Guyana right now Guyana is collecting billions of dollars um US dollars by the way but the 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 people the, the major part of the population they're not seeing any of it it's a fact it has been documented 90% 90% of all the, the these new contracts that are being generated out of the oil industry is going to one section of the population Guyana as you know is divided along a, a deep racial it has a deep racial divide mm -hmm. and now you've got the PPP in office which is the in which is the Indo-Guyanese party and all of those 90% of those contracts are going to Indo-Guyanese up to recently you had a, a group from the opposition who went up to Washington to talk to the Washington legislators last week to complain about you know this this whole racial divide within the country in the way that the government is operating even in parliament you know my colleagues are meant you know we're all talking about transparency even the opposition now which is the which is the afro guyanese part, cannot even get information when they request it in parliament they shut down they they request information um and the government and the you know they they, they their voices are not being heard even being heard even though even though by the way it's just a one member majority um in in, in the, the the opposition has started two and the the ruling party has started three so those are the kinds of things that we have to fix but i i agree with the caller in terms of transitioning over to to, to renewables using the revenues to transfer as a high priority transfer over renewables and again i really i i i also agree with making sure that the, the, the there's strong involvement with the other Caribbean co co countries in terms of establishing regulations, environmental regulations for the whole region, because that's where where it would impact not only the country itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Panka, is 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 there appetite uh, in uh, Suriname uh, for those uh, approaches that um, that Mr. Grave Sandy spoke about here? Uh, totally. Totally. We have been talking about re re renewable energies for some time. And at the same time, um, we're in the midst of the process of uh, extra of this uh, oil and gas industry, this off offshore oil and gas industry. I have to totally agree with uh, Dr. Adams because and uh, what listener uh, also uh, put there, put out there, I think at the meantime, when we are in the industry, we need that money. All countries that have all, all deposits need that money to jumpstart their economy. Mm -hmm. And it is to hope that the money will arrive where it, uh, where money to, to, to really develop the economy and that politicians uh, uh, um, would uh, invest the money wisely. But at, at the same time, we have to put some of that money, like Dr. Adam said, aside to develop the renewable energy, like in projects, we have sun, we have wind, we have all, all, all of those kinds, because we all know that even when the money will flow, that in the end, um, this, this oil and gas will end someday. It will end 
and then the money will stop. We have that experience in the future. That's why I want to recommend my article because I also talked with a Surinamese environmentalist, Erlan Slur, and he pointed out that we had for many years, for decades, we had this bauxite industry where we produce alumina for World War II for the Americans. It brought us so much money. And where is the industry nowadays? What have it brought us? We can't tell because our economy is still not that what we want it to be. So if we don't do things the other way, join forces with the Caribbean. If we say the leaders say we're one Caribbean, but on the other hand, I don't know what is taking them of what is withholding them for not joint forces together. Because if you look at all of these countries in the Caribbean as one of those experiences. Mm -hmm. And if we are separated, is that where the all companies want us? And Suriname has its experience with the bauxite industry, extract is still the same extractive industry. And it has brought us up to the, till this day, not much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Cloud, now I'm going to bring you back here. Uh, we have a question. I'm not too sure if Mr. Cloud can hear us, but uh, but I'm, I'm going to bring in uh, Mr. Cloud. Now, are you, are you hearing us, sir? Yes? Mr. Clouden, are you hearing us? But, yeah, but uh, I, I, Dr. Baba, I'm not. I'm having a little difficulties. Okay, but 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 I, I didn't I, quite I, hear I, all that was said at the former. Go ahead. Um, yes, I I do agree. Um, you know, wholeheartedly with Dr. Adams. Um, in response to um the the caller, my good friend, um question with respect to regional legislation. Well, I had suggested that in my thesis as way back as uh, early as uh, 1882, um, that we, we need to implement a framework for one, oil spill, regional oil spill contingency planning when we are into the exploration of, of oil in particular. Because if we have a spill, as Dr. Adams says, and, and which is a, a fact, the entire Eastern Caribbean, remember, it's a basin we're speaking of, the Caribbean basin. And therefore, a spill on contained um, by contingency planning in each island can devastate the, the, the tourist industry of the region. Mm -hmm. So I, I think um, Dr. Sandy is quite right that there was a need for regional legislation yeah to, absolutely to address, yes uh, but so uh, I, uh, what, uh, another viewer is asking if there is a framework within the united nations convention on the law of the sea uh to internally address issues in the context of missing documents or even in the context of uh, oil spills. What does the, 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 the Convention on the Law of the Sea say about those matters, Mr. Clouden? You're an expert well, the on this. The Convention speaks to, yes, the, the, the Convention speaks to the preservation uh, of the marine environment. Um, and the coastal states are obliged to follow even regional um, 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 frameworks with respect to the exploration and and the exploitation of, of hydrocarbon within the, the the coastal states jurisdiction but the the law of the sea convention also speaks of regional cooperation where necessary so as to prevent degradation of the marine environment especially when it comes to fisheries conservation and protection of fisheries jurisdiction that too could would have to be dealt with regionally because the, the 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 living resources of the zone straddle the zone so a boundary line although it 
it, it demarcates a jurisdiction issue, but it, it doesn't necessarily speak to a conservation and preservation issue. Um, flying fish is an example. When we did the treaty, when uh, Trinidad and Barbados had the treaty, they had to deal with flying fish, which the Barbadians had customarily fished for, for centuries, or well over 70, 80 years. The difficulty with that, however, and I had recommended to the Mitchell administration, but they didn't listen to, to any sort of advice emanating from their own experts here, that we entered into a third party interest um, concern in that there was sufficient scientific evidence with respect to the maximum sustainable yield for that species, that it, it, it is migratory because it straddles boundaries. In the case of Barbados and the flying fish, and I, I'm, I'm speaking, the, uh, I'm coming out with the need for regional um, legislation to combat all these eventualities. The fish spawns in Grenadian waters, and then it goes over, crosses the boundary, and straddles over to Trinidad waters, Trinidad and Tobago, and the Barbadians come down and fish there. So that we have an interest to protect the spawning propensity of the fish, to determine the sustainable yield of that species, so that coastal states are obliged in such circumstances to share and, and put quotas with respect to catch from other coastal states, adjoining coastal states. All of this could be addressed regionally through regional legislation. And each state implement its own conservation and protection mechanisms. That's the type of framework I think Dr. Sandy is alluded to. And I think it's absolutely necessary that these coastal states uh, uh, we're fortunate to have a, a, a region, CARICOM, we mm -hmm. can work um, to affect regional legislation that would impact both the living and non-living resources of our respective exclusive economic zone and continental shelf. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, gentlemen, the, this is such an important conversation. And I, I just want to, uh, on a full programming note here, uh, we did invite Mr. John Ogist to the program. He saw our message. I know that he read our message because there were two blue ticks on WhatsApp. He did not respond. We also invited uh, the former Minister of Energy, Mr. Gregory Bowen. We sent him a message. We Same thing. He read the message, two blue ticks. He did not respond. We reached out to Mr. Burke, who will be heading uh, this new committee. He did indicate that uh, he will not be speaking to the media until uh, they would have commenced their investigation and come up with a set of findings that they can report on. But for full disclosure, I want the Grenadian public to know that we reached out to these two gentlemen who were uh, in government before Mr. Ogist, as well as Mr. Bowen. Of course, the, the caveat with Mr. Ogist, he's indicating that he is under a gag order and that if you were to speak to anything in relation to, sounds familiar <laughs> there, Dr. Adams, gag orders, uh, th that if you were to speak to the media, uh, that uh, he can be subject to prosecution, uh, Dr. Adams. So that's, <laughs> that is the state of things. So what we want to do, uh, gentlemen, is that we will take a quick break now and uh, we would come up for some closing comments before we close today's program. Please stand by. Hello, everyone. Hello. I am Chantal McGuire, the local bred Grenadian actuary and asset liability management expert. Are you satisfied with your current finances? Are you curious and constantly looking for ways to make additional income? Join me on the Bob Report as we strive to empower you, a valued audience, to become more financially literate and help evolve Grenadians into a mindset that's investment focused and entrepreneurial. Literacy is about freedom. It's about being able to control your money and not letting your money control you. It's about foresight for a brighter future. Our core mission is to promote financial literacy and share money generating opportunities for everyone. 
Join us on the last Sunday every month, starting July 30th, as we strive to provide the keys to financial freedom. Now for some closing comments, Dr. Vincent Adams and uh, Mr. Harvey Panka. Uh, Mr. Panka, of course, I would want you to come back to discuss matters related to uh, media and journalism in the Caribbean at some point, given uh, that additional role that has been placed on you, that has been foisted upon you by your regional colleagues. We unfortunately have lost Mr. Clowden, but I do want to uh, close this conversation by um, setting up a comment that one of our viewers is making here, and that's Mr. Michael Marichaud, Bob Marichaud. He's saying, Michael Ross, uh, in his acclaimed book, The Oil Curse, says that most countries are rich in petroleum, have less democracy, less economic stability, and more frequent wars. So my friends in Guyana and Suriname, please be careful. Uh, Dr. Adams, uh, that is the context here, uh, Mr. Panka. But Mr. Panka, I would want to begin with you as we close the program with this very important caveat from Mr. Marisha. Um, yeah, he's definitely right. <laughs> he's definitely right because um, it is what it is. It is what it is. It, 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 we, we are, on paper, we are, de, we are democracies, but uh, in real life, it isn't what it has to be, what it must be. It, it, we don't get the information we need to get. They, they don't share the information that they need to share with the public. It is public information. Mm -hmm. It's not your oil. It's not, it's from the country. It's ours. Mm -hmm not from a particular person and you know it's greed and greed feeds corruption and if we can and and mo most of the caribbean countries has to deal with corruption even though a lot of all of the governments have on their agenda even on the caricom agenda that we will eradicate corruption out of the system but you know if the all companies would take individuals apart and promise them things that after this if you can guarantee this if you can give us this we will make you filthy rich and then it's another story and i think that there i i don't know what at this moment but we need this thing in the Caribbean that we have to join forces, that we have to have this legislation, uniform legislation in the Caribbean, that corruption can be prevented and all other things that are holding us back to have the guarantee that we all will prosper from this wealth that is bestowed upon us. Mm -hmm. So I think even as journalists, we also have the task to keep knocking on those doors that those information will be made public so that we, as the people of the Caribbean, we know what is going on if those companies, those multinationals are holding our money back if it is the government that is stealing the money, we have to know what's going on. So we have to keep knocking. We have to keep looking. We have to keep watching so that, yes, democracy in the end will persevere. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, Dr. Adams? <laughs> well, you know, I, I partially agree with the, with, with the comment, but I think... Um, it's not about the oil. It's about the governance of the oil. Um, in, those, in the countries with good governance that don't have these type of problems with corruption and, and non-transparency, etc., they do very well. Norway, Norway is, a, is an excellent example and some other countries around the world. But if you look at the countries such as in Africa, and now we're finding similar things like in, 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 in Guyana. It's because of that governance where there is no transparency. 
Um, and we're and, and one of the, 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 the most dreaded disease that is plaguing, especially our Caribbean people, it's there is no accountability for the politicians. We do not hold them accountable. I, I can speak for Guyana, like I said, we're very tribal. It doesn't matter if Satan comes down and run for your party, you're going to vote for your party. So the politicians have a free reign to do whatever they want to do. It breeds corruption. Mm -hmm. Um we, and that's why your programs such as yours, Dr. Bob, is very important to get the information to the people and educate them because people go about their daily business, but they do not understand. They listen to the politicians and every from all sides, everything, they're doing whatever they do. You know, it's hunky-dory, the government in office. But programs such as yours have to bring the information to, the, to the, the right information to make these folks knowledgeable so that they can hold the politicians um, uh, 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 accountable. Here's a good example. And we talk about, um, you know, integrating and using CARICOM, for example. Mm -hmm. It so happened. There's an organization that I am part of that it's it's a, more of a diaspora, but it has, it has uh, members in Guyana, highly... I mean, highly credentialed folks, PhDs and everything else in highly technical in, in the oil and gas industry. It's called the Oil and Gas Governance Network. Really powerful set of people. And we wrote a letter to CARICOM, to CARICOM asking for their intervention in terms of making sure that everything we're talking about here today is put into place in terms of, of management of Guyana's um, oil industry, to you know, to make it a Caribbean thing because it impacts the entire Caribbean, we send that letter to CARICOM. No answer whatsoever, not even an acknowledgement. We sent a similar letter to, to Miss Mia Motley because you know we, we, uh, we she, she she has been you know uh, you know out there as one of the leading voices in 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 the Caribbean. We sent the same letter to her to say, well, okay, you know, as, as a very influential leader in the Caribbean and internationally, we would like for you to intervene and, and you know, to, to, to see what is going on because it impacts the Caribbean. Not a single, not even an acknowledgement for her either. So you wonder what is going on. See, when we talk about getting Caribbean leaders together, you know, it, it, even though it may be a good idea, you wonder... Um, is it everybody just wants to protect their interests or they don't want to rock the boat in, in, in another country and not caring about the people's interests, but only looking at it. So those are the kind of challenges. We, when I was with the government of Guyana, we made an effort to, to, to in Suriname, to make an effort to, ha to, to have a partnership with Suriname in terms of our exploring, because Suriname is, where they're where they're developing is, is just a line that separates us really mm -hmm. so we had a meeting we set up a meeting i was part of that small delegation I, you know i was the technical person that delegation we had a, you know they had like three ministers at that meeting suriname we met in we met in 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 in, in um in suriname and we agreed to form a, a, a framework for establishing that partnership <laughs> and you wouldn't believe it so when suriname when we were exchanging correspondence, the first correspondence that came from Suriname, they had a map on their on, on their um on their correspondence, and guess what? The map showed the disputed area between Guyana and Suriname to be part of Suriname, mm -hmm. and it should you know the which means they took a chunk out of Guyana, which has been disputed by them, of course, and out of Guyana's map and demark it as as there so that that stopped all of the conversations um i i think that that since guyana started producing a, a whole lot of oil i think there has been recent attempts to to bring that conversation back together but so those are the kind of things that the 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 you know the barriers that we face if caricom can get involved I mean, what else, you know, and, and a leader such as Mia Motley just ignoring you know, legitimate issues that are brought before them. I mean, you know, you, you, it, it, it's very, very discouraging. 
And we've mm-hmm. got to change that. And the only people who can change that are the people. And people like yourself who educate the folks and give them the information to let them understand. Because they listen to these politicians. And everything is hunky-dory. And that's the only thing they hear. So it's very important for, like, to have programs like yours, Dr. Bob. And you know, I really appreciate it. And this year should yes. really, um, these are the kind of things that should continue to educate the people. So that they can hold their politicians who are making these decisions that affect their lives, hold them accountable. Yep, absolutely. Uh, very important point, holding uh, politicians accountable, irrespective of who it is uh, in power at any given time. Uh, we are the bosses. We, the people, are the bosses, certainly. Uh, Dr. Vincent Adams and Mr. Harvey Panker, thank you for appearing on this week's edition of The Bub Report. Unfortunately, we lost Mr. Clouden uh, due yeah. to some internet challenges there, but he made some very salient and valid points uh, leading up to this uh, closing segment. So we thank him as well for appearing on this week's program. Gentlemen, I hope I did not interrupt your early lunch, if you do have early lunch, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> do have a, a wonderful lunch, uh, and thank you again for appearing on this week's edition of The Bub Report. Thank, Thank you for you, having Dr. me. Dr. Bob, and, and, and thanks, Mr. Panko, and sorry yes. we lost Mr. Cloud, Mr. Cloud and all of our yes. listeners. Yeah, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, viewers and listeners, we also want to thank you for uh, your very uh, inspiring and important comments uh, in the chat. This is an important conversation that we will continue to have on uh, the Bub Report. And so I want to thank all of you for uh, participating by way of your comments uh, this morning into this afternoon. On behalf of the hardworking producers of The Bub Report, I am your humble host, Dr. Kellen Bub, wishing everyone a wonderful, safe, and productive week ahead. Take care now. Bye-bye. Uh, Hi, everyone. Thanks for checking out The Bub Report's social media pages. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch our weekly live show, follow our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram pages, and also subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can catch repeat episodes on Wednesdays at 4 and 5 p.m. respectively on CRFM Radio and GBN TV in Grenada. We are also viewed on Sundays at 8 p.m. on WPG10 throughout the Caribbean. Thanks for watching.